<clears throat> Today we're going to continue our discussion of a priori arguments for God's existence, and we're going to look specifically at two of them, Pascal's wager and then the argument from truth. So I want to turn first to Pascal's. Blaise Pascal was a French mathematician and also religious thinker who wrote uh, Pensées, uh, Thoughts, which is a work of remarkable power. Uh, and in addition to its sort of emotional power, he's arguing that religion does and ought to rest primarily on emotion, on feeling rather than reason. But also, he really gives us one of the early works in decision theory in this book. He lays out an argument for God's existence, or at least for believing in God's existence, that takes seriously arguments for probability. It was really around this time, the 17th century, that people were first formulating ideas about probability and how probabilistic arguments worked, what betting involved, how to think about things from a statistical point of view, and so on. And Pascal was at the foundation of that. He was one of the people who was actually thinking through these issues about probability and inductive argumentation for the first time. And so in thoughts, he gives us something really remarkable. Now, how does he get there? Well, it starts with a certain vision of human life. And in part, it's a very gloomy vision. But in part, it's one he thinks that points us toward religion. He says, let's imagine a number of men in chains and all condemned to death, where some are killed each day in sight of the others. And those who remain see their own fate in that of their fellows and wait their turn, looking at each other, other sorrowfully and without hope. It's an image of the condition of men. So in other words, he said, well, that's our situation. We're in this place. We didn't really ask to be put here. Here we are. We know we're going to die. We see other people condemned to death as well. We see some of them die every day. And by the way, when you get to be my age, you see this a lot more than your age. Uh, but in any event, you look and you say, yeah, OK, that's, that's our condition, all right. Here we are. We were condemned to be here. We really didn't ask for this. Um, moreover, we know we're all doomed to die, and we see some people dying every day. But nevertheless, he says, despite that image of ourselves as being without hope, without hope within the confines of this world, that thought can lead us to thoughts of another world. He says, by faith, we know God's existence. In glory, we'll know his nature. Now, that claim of knowledge, however, is one that he means only, <laughs> well, metaphorically. He says, if there's a God, he's infinitely incomprehensible. If there is a God, God is immensely complex. God is infinite. God really outstrips in his very nature the potential we have for thinking about him. So God's nature is really unknowable to us. It has not, neither parts nor limits. God has no affinity to us. We're then incapable of knowing either what he is or even if he is. And so Pascal is really rejecting here a whole tradition. A tradition that goes back to Augustine and Anselm, Aquinas, and a variety of other thinkers. He's saying, I don't think you can prove God's existence. I think reason is completely incapable of dealing with this situation. Can reason actually give you a compelling argument for God's existence? He says, no. Reason is powerless to do this. Even if it could give you an argument for something, it couldn't really give you an argument for God in any specific way because God's nature is unknowable. And so it's impossible to really have a solid argument in favor of God's existence. On the other hand, it's also impossible to have a solid argument against God's existence. Suppose you start with natural science and you talk about the sphere of what natural science can understand. You have no way of knowing that that's a complete description of the universe. In fact, you might think, as Aquinas does, that there must have been something that underlie all, underlies all of that, that was a first cause, for example, or an ultimate ground or something or other. There's no way for reason to decide whether there really is something behind the appearances that natural science describes, or whether those are just things that happen by chance. So in the end, he says, look, no rational argument is going to really be able to prove God's existence. No rational argument can disprove God's existence. So what can we do? He says, well, look, <laughs> you might accuse religious people of having no reason for their belief, but we're all in that position. In other words, everybody is in a position of not really having very solid reasons for their beliefs, whether it's in favor of God, in favor of a particular religion, against a religion, against God, etc. He says, who can blame Christians for not being able to give a reason for their belief? They profess a religion for which they can't give a reason. They declare that it's a foolishness, stultitia, in the Latin. Um, he's citing here 1 Corinthians. Then you complain you don't prove it. Well, if they proved it, they wouldn't be keeping their word. It's in lacking proofs that they're not lacking in sense. 
So in other words, he says, look, a lot of religious people admit there's no rational argument for this. Christians do that. Paul in 1 Corinthians, in effect, tells you, I don't have a rational argument for God's existence. In fact, I think reason is something that is ultimately going to count this as foolishness. And just in case you aren't familiar with it, I included 1 Corinthians there. I won't go through the whole thing. But, you know, where is this wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. And so Pascal says, look, a lot of religious people will tell you right the outset. They don't have an argument for this. That's part of their religious view. And so it doesn't make any sense to say, hey, you don't really have any reasons. They say that right up front. So here's our situation. It says, well, well, either God exists or God doesn't exist. That much we know from logic alone. But now he says, to which side shall we incline? Should we believe in God's existence or not? No rational argument is really going to give us support on either side. Reason can decide nothing here. There's an infinite chaos that separates us, separates us from knowledge of God, in other words. A game is being played at the extremity of this infinite distance where heads or tails will turn up. In other words, where it will turn out God exists or God doesn't exist. And we're not in a position of establishing through reason which it is. So what should we do? What will you wager? According to reason, you can do neither the one thing nor the other. According to reason, you can defend neither of the propositions. So we basically say, aha, place your bets. Does God exist or not? You're going to put your bet on God exists or your bet on God doesn't exist. Now, in a lot of contexts, you can walk away and decide you're not going to play the game. I don't know if any of you have been to Las Vegas. I went for the first time not too long ago, and I, it, I found it very, very creepy. Uh, but in any case, you know, there are all these tables and people are betting on various things and all these machines with flashing lights. And, you know, people are placing their bets. They're betting on red or betting on black or betting on 21 or betting on, you know, I, I don't know what happens on those machines. It seems like you want a bunch of pairs to appear or something. <laughs> it was confusing. I, I realized when I was there, it's not just that I don't like gambling. I don't know how to do it if I did this. It's like complicated. And I have no idea. Well, anyway. I just sort of thought it was like, you know, heads or tails. <laughs> I had no idea that it was like, you had to know stuff. Anyway, um, it, in this case, it really is like heads or tails, okay? Either God exists or God doesn't. There isn't really any complication to the game. There isn't any elaborate thing you need to know. In a way, there's nothing you can know that's going to really lead you to one side or the other. So what should you do? Well, here's the thing. You have to place a bet. You have to decide. So Ian Hacking, the philosopher of science, has said this is really the first well-understood contribution to decision theories. It's all about deciding under conditions of uncertainty. Okay, you have no way of knowing whether God exists or not. Now, a lot of religious people would say, well, wait a minute, we do, we have the scriptures. We have the Hebrew scriptures, or the New Testament, or we have the Quran, or we have the Buddhist scriptures, and so on and so forth. Read the sutras, read the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. But Pascal is saying, well, with respect to all of those, somebody can raise the question, how do I know that really is divinely inspired? I might think that that's all wrong-headed, and indeed, each religion tends to think that about the other religion scriptures. So let's put those aside and assume that none of those are really secure enough to pro provide a firm foundation. Well, then we're in a condition of uncertainty. So what should we do? Now, in fact, he says, well, we're doing this kind of thing all the time. If you say, well, here's the answer, don't decide under uncertainty, we're doing it constantly. What are some situations where we reach decisions and think it's reasonable to reach decisions or take actions despite the fact that we're uncertain. We're not sure what the outcome is. Yeah? Good, choosing classes to take, right? You look at the spring schedule and you think, oh, I'll take this and I'll take this and I'll take this. Do you know whether those are going to be good or not? Really, it's a condition of uncertainty. And the more you're around the university, you more, the more you get sort of through the grapevine sense of which courses are really good and which ones are not so good. But initially, you're really choosing under conditions of uncertainty. And I found that even knowing a lot, I, in a way, my batting average in choosing good courses went down, it seemed to me, as I approached being senior. Um, and why? Partly because, uh, yeah, why? That's a good question. Maybe I'm stupid, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe just unlucky, or in a couple of cases, I mean, here, I thought I had it all figured out. And by the way, I do recommend this general technique. The first week or two, I would go to lots of classes. And I would decide on the basis of the first day or two, you know, is this class I want to stay in? I'd register for some officially. But then I'd go to almost as many just on the side. And then I'd do some ad dropping and think like that course is going to be better. 
And I do recommend that in general, but sometimes you can be fooled. One seminar turned out the professor had great things to say, and they were all in the first class. And so I thought, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be like this every day. And then I found out, no, that was really it. You know, he had like one page of insights into this particular philosopher, and once that was done, I was kind of like, okay, um, now what are we going to do? <laughs> it was sort of awful. Uh, but it was a great first presentation. It's kind of like you see a great ad, right? The trailer for the movie is awesome. And then you watch the movie and you think, oh, every good scene is already in the trailer. And it was like that. So anyway, even that's not a perfect technique. But yes, in deciding what courses to take, you're really deciding under uncertainty. What are other instances of this? Yeah. Find something online. Good. Find something online, right? You don't really, you haven't tried it on and think, oh, that's a nice pair of shoes. And gosh, they're only $15. How much is there, how risk is it? So you order those shoes. And it's uncertain. Will they fit or not? Will they look like that when they arrive? And so on and so forth. Will they hold up? Blah, 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 blah. So in short, yeah, buying something sight unseen is often like this. There's uncertainty there, and yet you might well decide to do it. Other examples. Apply for a job. Apply for a job. Good, you apply for a job. You don't know whether you're going to like it or not. You don't really know whether you're well qualified, whether what you're, they're going to be expecting you to do is going to be reasonable or not. You don't know whether you're going to like the people you work with. They're great uncertainty surrounding those kinds of decisions. And yet it would be absurd to say, well, <laughs> never take a job because you know, you're not sure what, what it's going to be like. Never take a class because you don't know whether it's really going to be very good. You make decisions here even though there is uncertainty. Yeah? Good, voting for a politician. Do you know what that politician is going to do in office? Do you know whether they're going to keep their campaign promises and so forth? No. Conditions of great uncertainty. What would Donald Trump do in office? What would Hillary Clinton do in office? What would Gary Johnson do in office, et cetera, et cetera? You end up thinking, well, I have some evidence about this. You don't really know, right? It's a condition of considerable uncertainty. So we're making these decisions all the time. Now, Pascal says, well, here's a crucial one. Does God exist? Place your bet. There is a condition here, he says, assume of total uncertainty. So let's just suppose that you really have no evidence that points either way, that's at all conclusive. There's really, let's say to make it simple, no data whatever. What should you do? Now, you can't just refuse to bet. Because God, in his vision, God is not going to tolerate your indecision, okay? In the end, you either bet to live a life of faith or you don't. So, what should you do? Here's the wager he envisions, and his argument for betting on God's existence. He says, let's weigh the gain and loss in wagering that God is. Let's estimate these two chances. If you gain, you gain all. If you lose, you lose nothing. Wager then without hesitation that he is. So here's the idea. Suppose you bet that God exists, and God does exist. You gain the glories of heaven. You gain an infinite amount, okay? The payoff is really huge. But suppose you bet that God doesn't exist, and you're right. You gain nothing. It's like, you think when you die, that's just the end, it's all over. And you're right. What did it profit you to be right? Nothing. And so he says, look, on the one direction, you're going to gain everything. The other direction, if you're right, or, well, if you're right, you really don't gain anything. If you lose, you don't gain anything. So wager that he is. Here's a way we might represent this. He's in effect saying, either there's a god or there is no god. And so the two columns represent those two possibilities. And your choice is to believe or not to believe. To live a life of faith, let's say, or not to live a life of faith. So what happens? Suppose you believe and God exists. Then you get into heaven when you die. What if you believe and there is no god? Well, at least you lead a virtuous life. At least you gain virtue. Suppose you don't believe in God exists. Ah, uh, now you're in trouble. Okay, the fires of hell. Suppose you don't believe and there is no God. Then you get an afterlife which is just blank. Okay, nothing. So, and in this life you don't get the life of virtue because you're really not motivated to live virtuous. So in the end, he says, look, suppose God exists, you're way better off believing. But suppose God doesn't exist, you're still better off believing. That life of virtue is better than a life without virtue. And so whether God exists or not, you gain. So a bet on God can't lose. You get either heaven or virtue. <laughs> but a bet against God can't win. You either get hell or nothing at all. And so he ends up saying, 
obviously the better thing to do is bet that he is. So here's the idea. If God exists, well then, gosh, it's easy, right? Heaven is better than that. <laughs> if God doesn't exist, he thinks it's also pretty easy. Virtue is better than nothing. Now, it's not really exactly nothing. Because presumably the person who li lives the life of virtue thinking that there's a God who will, let's say, punish them for misdeeds in the afterlife, but is wrong about that, gains something. What do they gain? Suppose the atheist turns out to be right. Do they in any way benefit during this life from their atheism? Yeah? All right, good. They don't waste their energies, you might say, directed towards something that doesn't exist. So you might think, well, at least I'm not wasting my time in church or doing things like that. Uh, and so there's that kind of gain. Is there any other sort of gain? Yeah? Okay, you are constrained, and so you might think, look, I, it's not just that I don't have to spend time on those observances that my religion tells me I ought to observe, it's also that I'm not constrained by those moral rules. So if I want to eat pork, I can eat pork. If I want to, I don't know, engage in fornication, I can fornicate. If I want to commit murder, I can commit murders, and so on and so forth. So whatever it is, you might think, yeah, I think I gained my, gain, you know, being able to discard those rules. And there's another thing you might get. Yeah. Okay. Couldn't you be virtuous without believing in God? Yeah, I think Pascal would say, yes, you could. The thing is, there's less of a motivation. So you could be a virtuous person without believing. But on the other hand, imagine yourself in a condition of temptation. And you think, ooh, what happens if I give into temptation? The religious person thinks, well, not only whatever ordinary bad things might happen, but also God might be upset with me. Um, the other person has those everyday kinds of considerations, but without God saying, mm. And so who is going to have the more, the greater motivation to actually resist temptation? The person who has God there as a potential disapprover. And so he's saying, look, I'm not saying it's impossible to be virtuous and not religious. It's just that your odds are better if you're religious. There's going to be an additional weight on the scale that's going to tend to to push you more toward virtue. So the probabilities of being virtuous rise, I think is all you would say. Yeah? Um, what do you think, Pascal, would um, think about people taking more of a skeptical approach that they could <coughs> exist or could not exist, but they're going to go their own values? Ah, OK, good. What about the person who says, well, look, I'm sort of skeptical about this. Now, he is in a way, too. Right? He's saying, well, reason can't really give me uh, any powerful reason to believe or reason not to believe. So it's not really at that level that we're going to settle this question. So there's a kind of skepticism underlying this. But he's saying, nevertheless, I can make a decision despite that knowledge uh, it, on the basis of what's good for me. Now, what about the person who says, look, I, I don't want to just believe or not believe. I think it's more complicated than that. I want to pursue spirituality in my own way. Remember that clip of Homer Simpson saying, you know, yeah, I decided not to go to church. I'll, I'll worship you in my own way, God. And, you know, what about that? Well, and in fact, one of the objections we'll look at here is that there really need to be a lot more rows on this table. Because after all, you believe. Well, are you a believing Catholic or Protestant or Jew or Hindu or Muslim, etc., etc., etc.? There might be lots of different ways of believing. And you don't believe, there might be lots of different ways of doing that. Saying, well, I don't really believe in God, but I believe in something higher, or I believe in some, you know, that spirituality is important, and so on and so forth. So it might be that. Simplifying it into two rows is way too simple, and we need some in-between things. Also, you might think God's attitude toward the atheist and God's attitude toward the agnostic are going to be different. The person who says, look, I really don't feel that I can place a bet is maybe in a different position from the person who says, I place a bet that God doesn't exist. And so I think there are a bunch of reasons why we might think this table is too simple, and we need additional rows of the table to make any sense. Pascal was basically assuming Look, uh, you know, if you're going to be religious, you're going to be Catholic. And so the real choice is Catholicism or atheism. There's nothing else. <laughs> and that's a little too simple vision of the world. But nevertheless, in France in the 17th century, that seemed, I guess, like a plausible <laughs> start. Yeah? If God is holy, then you can just forgive everyone who doesn't believe. Ah, so, all right. Suppose God is entirely good and entirely forgiving. So suppose you're a universalist and you say, well, actually, I think you're going to get into heaven either way. 
then, if we've got the God picture, we'd really have a, a situation where we've got heaven in both of those slots. Now, how would that change the situation? Well, if God doesn't exist, you're still better off believing, you would say, because your probabilities of leading a virtuous life are increased. But what about God's existence? In the end, from that point of view, you would say, well, it doesn't make any difference or not. You still have nothing to lose by betting that God exists, though you might not have anything to gain either. Now, of course, you might not think that God's that forgiving. Maybe God's only forgiving, I don't know, in the purgatory sense. Right? Pope Gregory invented the idea of pur purgatory to think, look, there are a lot of people who aren't really bad enough to deserve hell, but aren't really good enough to deserve heaven either, and so we're going to put them in the farm, please, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Uh, and they're going to have to spend a while before making it to the majors of heaven. Uh, and if you have that sort of view, then, you know, there is this uh, intermediate status of heaven in training, um, <laughs> which makes a kind of sense. Actually, some contemporary philosophers have talked about this. Look, the gradations of goodness and badness are more or less on a continuum. There's something very strange about drawing a firm line and saying above this line you get into heaven and below this line you don't. And so that feels very arbitrary because at some point somebody's going to be admitted to heaven, even though just, they're just the tiniest bit better than a person who is condemned. And that seems to offend our ideas of justice. I, I'm sure what inspired this paper, by the way, is assigning grades at the end of the semester in a large class. When you think, wait, well, where do I stop giving A's, for example? This person has an 89.9. Am I going to really give them a B? Oh, but what about the person who has an 89.85? Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so, anyway, you might think, well, may, yeah, maybe we, maybe it's more like that show, The Good Place, I was telling you about, where actually there are many different neighborhoods, and the quality of the neighborhood depends on the quality of your life. So, anyway, you're right. That that's going to complicate this picture too. Now, notice the way he lays this out. Here's his argument about virtue. He says, if you're religious, if you place your bet on God, you'll be a faithful, humble, grateful, generous person, a sincere friend, you'll be truthful. Certainly you won't have these poisonous pleasures, glory and luxury, but won't you have others? So he admits, you're giving something up. It's not like it's pure gain. I'll tell you that you'll thereby gain in this life, and that at each step you take on the road, you'll see so great a certainty of gain, so much nothingness in what you risk, that you will at last recognize you've wagered for something certain and infinite, for which you've given nothing. So he says, well, in comparison with worldly power, in comparison with glory, in comparison with luxury, it turns out that actually virtue is very much more valuable. Because in the end, what difference does it make? There's actually a nice book from uh, George Lucas, I think, saying, look, having money doesn't solve your problems. Having a dead battery in your Mercedes is actually more irritating than having a dead battery in your Chevy. And in a way, that's Pascal's point. It's like, I'm not saying there's nothing to world goods. Yeah, there is, and you'll be giving up some of those you'll be giving up maybe a considerable amount. But a virtuous person will realize that that's well worth the trade, that there is in fact no comparison. Would you pollute your soul in order to gain that BMW or that Mercedes or that private airplane or that whatever it is? No, and at least the virtuous person would not think those things are comparable at all. So, here's one way of putting his point. Belief, Pascal is saying, is a dominant strategy. A dominant strategy in game theory is one that you're better off following whatever the other person does, whatever the facts happen to be. And in this case, belief, at least if he's right about the way this matrix looks, is a dominant strategy. If God exists, you're better off believing. If God doesn't exist, you're better off believing. So no matter what, you're better off believing. And that's what it means to have a dominant strategy. Okay, so in general, in game theory, people advise play your dominant strategy. If you win, if you end up better off, no matter what the other person does, no matter what the facts are, if you do this, then by all means do it. Now, if many people are playing at the same time and all do that, you can get into trouble. That's a situation called the prisoner's dilemma. But here, since presumably God isn't playing and your fate is not going to be depending on what other people do, there's no danger of your playing your dominant strategy, interfering and causing any bad effects. It's a very simple thing. In this case, you're better off believing whether God exists or not. Well, there are a number of objections. We've already talked about one of them, the idea that this is too simple. There need to be more roads. Should I be a faithful Catholic? Should I be a faithful Methodist or Presbyterian or Baptist? Or should I be Amish or should I be um, Jewish? And if Jewish, then I, should I be Orthodox or conservative um, or Reconstructionist? What about um, Islam? What about 
Buddhism, there are all sorts of different versions of Buddhism. Should I be Theravada? Should I be Mahayana? Should I be pure land? And so on and so forth. And so you could end up saying, look, this you believe part, actually that's an array of a bunch of different choices. And the you don't believe, as we said, it might be, you know, some people are just going to refrain from betting. Some are going to be definitely atheists and bet that God doesn't exist. Some are going to say, well, I don't know, I do yoga, isn't that good enough? <laughs> and so so forth. <laughs> so in short, there might be many different paths there, there too. Yeah. Um, in in case of this applications, um, could you say that you know finding a natural God uh, is a more process that needs to be somewhere to step into communication to the So in fact, you have to have a single for that first place. So like they expect the whole picture to be a fun, and it's not actually the case in the process at all. So you like, oh now I know that you know that you can't. Good. Okay, excellent. His point is, look, this might not really be about following this religion or that religion, etc., etc. It's a question of taking that first step. You might say, the person who lives a life of faith, whatever tradition they happen to follow, has to take that first step of believing in God and actually pursuing that life of faith. And then, after all, if God is infinite and we're finite beings, We'll never fully understand God, but we can take steps toward a greater understanding, and that person can then start on that path of greater understanding. So in a way, this is about taking that first step. It's not about the details of how it all goes. One way of looking at this is to say that it presupposes an image of God that really doesn't care if you're Presbyterian or Catholic or Hindu or Buddhist, etc., etc. Another way of looking at it is that it's really about that initial step. It's not about the details. So it's not really, as I said a moment ago, that he just assumes the only way of doing this is to be Catholic. It may be that he's really interested in something much more elemental. Before you could be a good Methodist, a good Catholic, a good Hindu, a good Buddhist, a good Muslim, and so on, you've got to take that first step. And this is really about that first step. Then the rest is details to be worked out later. So don't think of those as rows on the table. Think of that as something that comes afterwards when I think, how should I actually do this? This isn't a how question. This is a weather question. And so I think the way he's thinking of it is precisely that. I'm not trying to tell you how to believe in God here, or how to pursue a religious life. I'm just saying you've got a choice of whether to do it in some form or other or not. And that's the choice. It's that first step that's at issue here, not how things are going to go after that. And so, yeah, I think he really views that as, I'm talking about that first step, this basic question of do I, do I walk through that door and do I commit myself to this in some form or other? Not in what form exactly I'll, I'll take that. All right, well, that's one sort of objection. Another objection that some people have raised is maybe there need to be more columns here. It's not just that God exists or no God, but maybe we have to think, well, which God exists? <laughs> is it the Jehovah of the Old Testament? Is it the New Testament God? Is it um, Allah? Is it uh, the Buddha? <laughs> is it, unless, I mean, the Buddha isn't really, well, he's divine, but not like a God. But there are versions of Buddhism that have something like a god. Um, is it Brahman in Hinduism? Is it the Tao? Is it something else? And so we can try to fill in many of these categories with different gods. And I think that it makes a difference. Maybe it's, a, it's basically Homer Simpson, Simpson's objection. Wait, maybe if we've chosen the wrong religion, then every Sunday we're making God matter and matter. <laughs> and so, so really, you could think, yeah, it's not just God or no God. You've got to decide which God, and that's more complicated. So that's a possible objection. A lot of people raise the objection that this assumes that the existence of God is at least possible, that God's existence has non-zero probability. Now, I put a question mark there because I don't actually think, as I've constructed it, the argument presupposes that at all. Why? Because suppose God is just impossible and that that left column is just irrelevant. We still have the argument pertaining to the right column, and so it doesn't matter for, from Pascal's point of view whether God's existence is even possible or not. Um, either God exists or God doesn't exist, but the whole point is that belief is a dominant strategy, so you're better off whether or not God exists. Nothing here presupposes the possibility. A lot of people try to reconstruct this argument, though, in a different way and say, look, it's a question of placing some sort of value here. In fact, the argument is that the value of believing in God if God exists is infinite. And of not believing is then a negative sort of infinity. But then there are finite values in those other places, and then it's a complicated probability calculation involving both finite and infinite quantities. 
And then it depends a lot what the probabilities of the two categories are and so forth. I actually think it's a much simpler argument. I don't think any of that stuff matters. I think his point is just you're better off believing whether or not God exists, period. And it's not a question of weighing, weighing all these probabilities. But if you think, for example, that thing I've listed as a blank, um, actually does have a positive value, and that there are significant negative values to believing in there not being a God, then actually you're going to think this is a much more complicated calculation. So there are people who reconstruct this argument along those lines, saying, what do you mean? I gain virtue and I lose nothing. I cared about those players. I wanted that BMW, et cetera. And I'm now losing these things. And so actually, I think if there is no God, it turns out the religious life is a losing bet. And then, of course, you're going to need to know a lot more about the probabilities and values. Well, what does all this mean? For Pascal, it really comes down to this. Okay, Religion is beyond the power of reason to decide. He isn't really giving you an argument, notice, that God exists. He's just saying you're better off believing that God exists. And that's a very strange kind of argument in a way. He hasn't proved God's existence. He's just saying you're better off if you think he does, whether or not he does. So he hasn't given you any reason for thinking that left-hand column is the true one. He simply said you've got to place a bet in leading a certain kind of life. You're better off placing a bet on the side of faith. So he quotes Augustine. Reason would never submit if it didn't judge that there are some occasions on which it ought to submit. It's then right for it to submit when it judges that it ought to. There's nothing so conformable to reason as this disavowal of reason. So at certain points, reason recognizes, he says, that it can't solve the problem. And so at that point, it is actually rational to be non-rational. <laughs> uh, the reasonable thing to do is let reason step aside and decide on some other basis. So he says, actually, it's not just sometimes. All of our reasoning reduces itself to yielding to feeling. So in the end, he's saying something like this. Something that Hume later says when he says that reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. In the end, we decide all sorts of things on the basis of feel, not of reason. We reconstruct various rational arguments, rationalizations, if you will, to explain to ourselves and to others why we think this. But in the end, it comes down to a matter of feeling, a reaction inside us, instinct, something like that. It's a matter of the heart, not of the mind. And reasoning ends up resting on those feelings. That's not to say reasoning has no value, that it's mere rationalization. Sometimes it might be important. But the fact is that it starts with feeling. It starts with instinct. And so in the end, the heart really underlies the mind. Well, he says, in the end, <laughs> this is perhaps the most famous line in Pascal. The heart has its reasons which reason does not. The heart has its reasons which reason does not. In fact, reason can't know fully why the heart wants what it wants, why the heart opts for this rather than that. But in the end, he says, look, despite what I've said, despite what any other philosopher says, people are going to believe or not believe based on matters of the heart, more than on matters of the mind. There's this old saying, there are no atheists in philosophers. <laughs> and it's based on this idea that, in a sense, feeling is what ultimately drives these decisions. I've known a number of people who were atheists their whole life, and then on their deathbed, suddenly say, huh, maybe I should rethink this. <laughs> and it's partly on the basis of, well, fear, on the basis of things going on in the heart, not reason. It's not like reason says, oh, I'm now dying. I never thought that would happen. Wow, this is a new fact. I better figure it in my rational calculations. No, it's something else going on. And Pascal would say, it's fine for it to be something like that. That's not something to scoff at. That's, in the end, what drives all of our actions. Suppose I were to bring a cat to class, I have many to choose from, and just drop it off of this, like throw it. You'd all think that's terrible, right? A terrible thing to do to a cat, especially if I threw it at you. <laughs> but worse, you know, I might bring my cat Otis, who is a bit of a pain in the butt, and just pick him up and say, I'm tired of this cat, and throw him at you. You would all think that's an awful thing to do. And it's not based on reason. It's not that your mind will quickly say, wait, I remember the utilitarian calculus, pleasure over pain, this is going to cause the pain. I don't see any corresponding pleasure, it's causing me distress, that whole pain, therefore bad. <laughs> Instead, it's really a matter of the heart, it's a matter of instinct, where you'll say, oh, gratuitous cruelty, and you will immediately respond on the basis of something in the heart. And so he said, it's the heart in the end that experiences God, not the reason. This, then, is faith, God felt by the heart, not by the reason. 
Why within any religious tradition? Do people write literature? Do they write poetry? Do they construct art? Beautiful temples, for example, cathedrals, etc. Why do they write religious music? In the end, to appeal to the heart, not just to appeal to reason. So, he says, the knowledge of God is very far from the love of him. You can love God and have this commitment of the heart without any rational understanding. Indeed, in a sense, that's the essence of faith. So here he puts it in a little slogan. Heart, instinct, principles. And in that order, really principles of reason rest on our instincts and those rest on feelings of the heart. And so in the end, it's the feelings of the heart that control us, the feelings of the heart that drive us in one direction. And rationality is something added on top of that. It's something that then is introduced to try to explain those feelings to others, explain them to ourselves, get them in line with each other, because admittedly, our feelings can be contradictory or sometimes so mixed that we aren't sure what to do. So the principles do play a role, but it's a der derivative role, role. It's a subsidiary one. It is not primary. In the end, he says, we know truth, not only by reason, but also by the heart. And it's in this last way that we know our first principles. And reason, which has no part in it, tries in vain to impute. Almost any ethicist says there are first principles. Often there's just one first principle, like the principle of utility. Or like some other first principles will encounter. Maybe the golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated. Or maybe the silver rule, don't treat others the way you wouldn't want to be treated. Or Kant's categorical imperative, respect everyone. Um, decide on the basis of principle in a nutshell. Those are things that are first principles. And how can you argue for those? In the end, Pascal says you don't. Those are supported just by the heart. Well, he does think this actually undermines skepticism. He says the skeptics <laughs> labor to no purpose. We know we don't dream. Well, not that we never dream, but that we are dreaming right now. And he says, however impossible it is for us to prove it by reason, that just demonstrates the weakness of reason, not that the skeptic is right. Who among you has ever thought, as we were discussing skepticism, oh yeah, I bet I'm dreaming right now? No one. Okay, we know we're not dreaming. And so, in fact, it's not that we're convinced by the skeptical conclusion. We push it aside and say, aha, it turns out that reason in the end is incapable of proving something that we thought it would have been able to prove. It turns out it can't be. But that's okay. Those things rest in the end on instinct, on the heart. And reason has to trust those instincts, those intuitions of the heart and base everything on. Well, I'm going to conclude by just saying a few words about Augustine's argument from truth, which is also an a priori argument, and one that I'm writing a book about now. So I admit, this is a little bit self-indulgent, um, and I won't go through it in much detail. But here's the idea of his argument from truth. Plato gives us an argument for the forms. If there are no universals, or if all these universals end up being mind-dependent, then truth is going to end up being relative. Why? If there are no universals at all, you're just using terms, and I'm using them to refer to particular objects. There's nothing that guarantees that my use corresponds to your use. And if these forms are really inside our heads, then the form in my head of what justice is, let's say, may not match the form of justice in your head. And then what? Then, at best, either we're skeptics and so we say, so we don't know what justice is, or we're relativists who say, well, it's just justice for you, justice for me. There's no such thing as justice, full stop. But this argument goes on. Truth is not, in fact, relative in this way. One plus one is two. For everybody at all times, in all places, in all cultures, it's not something relative to anyone. But if there are mind-independent truths, there are mind-independent universals. And these truths, these eternal truths, like the truths of mathematics and mind-independent universals go together. But those truths are eternal. They don't vary with culture or with time. And so that requires an eternal mind. These forms have to be something outside your mind or my mind. They have to be mental so that we can in some way relate to them. But if they're mental and yet outside your mind or my mind, there, there must be some other mind they're part of. Moreover, if they're eternal truths, it must be an eternal mind. And so in the end, there is an eternal mind, namely God. And that's Augustine's argument for God's existence. The forms have to be somewhere. The forms have to be things we can actually understand things that do allow us to overcome relativism, allow us to overcome skepticism, but they can't be in any individual mind. Yet they've got to be in a mind, otherwise they would be unintelligible. There would be no solution to Plato's problem of how we interact with them. So they must be in some other mind, namely an eternal mind, God's. 
So, in the end, he says, <laughs> there are all sorts of things we know that are not just known for you, for me, and so on, but that are general. He says the truth is something, at least often, that we hold in common. It's one truth common to all of us. We all see those truths with our individual minds. Consequently, he says, if we think there are truths like that, not just mathematics, but other things, like we ought to live justly, or the better should be preferred to the worse, <laughs> or like we should be compared with like, every man should be given his due, and so on. If there are things like that that are eternally true, necessarily true, there must be a necessary mind, there must be eternal, an eternal mind where these things hold. So one truth is going to entail one mind. And I'll just skip forward quickly. In the end, God has to be that mind. So, he says, in the end, there has to be something above our minds, which is God, um, provided there's nothing else higher. So he says, if there's anything more excellent, it's this, which is God. And so God, in a certain sense, is truth itself. So Augustine ends up, oh, now I go into a bunch of complicated stuff, and I'm going to leave it out. Yeah, I'm going to skip all this. Oh, that's like everything. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, let me just skip ahead to this. Sorry. Um, we've said there is this kind of argument for skepticism, right? That says, look, um, there are these skeptical scenarios, like me being a brain in a vat, Descartes' evil deceiver, all of those things. That those are possible. Could be that I'm in one of those. And if I don't have any grounds for discounting that, it looks like I can't have any knowledge. But wait a minute, of course I have knowledge. I know that I exist. I know that one plus one is two. So actually, there must be a way for me to discount those technical scenarios. I must be able to hear Descartes' story about the evil and secret and say, well, could be. But nevertheless, right? I still think I know these things. And how could we do that? We must have grounds for discounting these skeptical scenarios. That's a sort of transcendental argument, notice. We're saying if it's possible for me to have knowledge, I've got to have a way of discounting these skeptical scenarios, of saying, despite their possibility, they're not something I have to take seriously. And what would that mean? What would provide such grounds? In the end, my use of these terms, like justice, or for that matter, triangular, or anything else, has to be anchored to something. Something outside of me, something that is transcendent, something I can know about, and that thing could only be something in the mind of God. So in the end, if I've got any universal and necessary knowledge at all, then I need a universal and necessary and eternal mind, and that will have to be the mind of God.